How'd you get in there? Today we're going to be learning soldering. You don't know how to solder, but have a few items in your game collection that could use some repairs. Not everything needs soldering to repair it, but you might as well be prepared just in case. Let's go over some basics with soldering and how you can do it with no previous experience. Safety. I know this is probably the most boring part, but it is the most important. Before you start fixing things, it's good to know what you can do to protect yourself. You should always be in a well-ventilated area, preferably with a fan running when you were soldering. The fumes are toxic, and even though I think some of the flux smell really good, you really shouldn't be breathing it in. I have a little desktop fan with a filter that I bought from Amazon to help with this. I also have an overhead fan that circulates the air pretty well in my work area too. There are multiple options to make sure you have enough ventilation while you're working. You could either work outside, you can work inside with a fan above, or work next to a window. You could even do it inside of a giant fume hood if you'd like, but just find a good option that fits your space. If you have a 3D printer, you could even print this little guy as a great option. Whatever you go with, just know that the smoke and fumes you see coming from the solder aren't good for you and you should have something in place to help with that. Stands and holders. Get a soldering stand to hold your iron in place. You could buy the basic plug-in type of soldering iron, but they normally do not come with a holder. They have a very simple stand instead. I personally do not like these because they can be bumped easily while you're working. Then the iron falls over and can either damage the table or burn you. And it goes without saying, but don't touch the end of the iron. It's a little hot. The stand I have is built in to accommodate a sponge for the cleaning of the tip of the iron so it's dual use. Besides, it's a little heavier and keeps the iron in place. I bumped the cord plenty of times while picking up other tools and if I had a simple stand instead of a holder, it would have fallen out of place and burned something. You do not want to have anything but what you were working on touched the hot end of the iron. Trust me, it's not fun. Eye protection. You should also have something protecting your eyes while you're at it too. Wearing safety glasses is probably the best way to do this. I can attest that these should be worn since I've literally had solder pop and explode while I was working with it. This one seems like an odd one, but when you're done soldering for the day, wash your hands. Flux residue and other debris get on your hands while you're working, and do you really want that getting into your body? It's a simple task to eventually make into a habit, but it's something that is often forgotten while working with chemicals or solder. That's the basics of safety stuff, but what tools should you get? There's a a lot of irons to choose from. If I was starting from scratch again, I would pick up something simple that doesn't have a lot of fancy features. Soldering irons for electronics are smaller and they're the ones you want for circuit and video game repairs. You can get the larger soldering guns, but those won't really help with small repairs and are really for larger jobs like working on appliances. Just make sure it can operate at a proper temperature for the solder you'll be using, which is typically around 700 degrees Fahrenheit. Soldering tips, however, are a preference item. I personally use a smaller chisel tip for my repair since it's big enough to do larger jobs like replacements of batteries and cartridges, but it's small enough to heat up component pins if necessary. I originally tried a few different types like the very small pen tip or the larger flat blade ones, but I always came back to the smaller chisel tip. For me it was just a really good middle of the road option, but for someone else they may like the other tips better. I would suggest getting a multi-pack of these tips and see what works best for you. They aren't super expensive and you can choose what you like after you're using them. On a side note, make sure they are tinned when purchasing too. We'll go over that later. Keeping your tools clean is pretty much a necessity. Either having a sponge or some brass wool is completely necessary. The tip of your iron will get dirty and it must be cleaned regularly for it to accept and heat a solder efficiently. A sponge is typically included with most kits since it is the cheapest option, but it does have some drawbacks like cooling your tips quickly which also supposedly reduces the life of them but I really haven't noticed much of that personally. The other option is a brass wool coil. It removes all the debris without reducing the temp of the tip, but is a little bit more money. I use both depending on what I'm doing. If I need to clean off some excess flux, I use the wet sponge. However, if I have excess solder on the tip, then I use the brass wool or a combination of the two. It really depends on the situation, but regardless of what you use, just keep your iron clean all the time. But what solder should you use? I use 6040 rosin core solder for all my repairs, which probably means nothing to someone watching this video. The 6040 is the percentage of tin and lead in the solder, so 60% tin and 40% lead in this case. And rosin core means it has flux on the inside of the solder. Flux is basically a cleaning agent that helps to prepare the metal surfaces for connection and allows the solder to flow much more easily. You can purchase more flux in either a paste or liquid form, but it really helps to have it built in. That way you don't need to worry about always using it separately. Rosin flux is also primarily made of pine tree sap, which also explains why I like the smell sometimes. It's kind of like people 
absolutely love to smell the gas. You know it's bad to smell it, but for some reason you just can't resist having a few whiffs. You can also buy lead-free rosin core solder, which is becoming way more common than the 6040 stuff. The melting temperatures are all different for solder, so be sure to check what temp you should be operating at for what you're using. I have my iron set to 700 degrees Fahrenheit, and it works well for me using a 6040. These may not be necessary right away, but I would also recommend getting a nice pair of flush trim side cutters if you can. These can fit into hard to reach places, as well as trimming the ends of component legs too. If you're cutting any wires or even modifying part of a case, some side cutters will come in handy there as well. So will tweezers for holding parts, but those are normally included in the soldering kits. That covers most of the basic items needed, but now let's move on to the actual process. So where do you even begin? Let's say your copy of Little Samson stopped working and you want to fix it. Before you do, I highly recommend some practice first. This way you don't start working on an item that may be permanently damaged if you mess it up. So maybe don't fix any of your collection just yet. Start with some old electronics that you have laying around the house that you don't need or weren't going to ever use again. Maybe an old lamp or an old DVD player sitting in your garage gathering dust. If you don't have anything to work with, go to the thrift store or garage sales and pick something up really cheap. It doesn't have to be working. The point is to have some circuit boards and wires to work on that aren't critical if they're destroyed. Then just disassemble your item and give yourself some test parts to work with. Soldering wires. Probably the most abundant item to find around your house, but how do you join two wires that have been separated? There are many ways to do it, but let's start with the most basic. Have your wires prepped by removing any insulation with either a knife or wire strippers. Most electronics use stranded wires, so twist the ends so they stay together and are in one nice tight bundle. It's not required, but if it helps, use a pair of helping hands clips like these to hold the wires in place. Then add a little bit of solder to the end by touching the iron to the back side of the bare wire. This allows it to heat up, then apply your solder opposite to the iron's tip. Solder will always flow towards the heating element, so if you add it in this way, it should coat the entire wire without having a lot of excess. This process is called tinning. Where possible, always make sure to tin the items that you're attaching, so it'll make the process much easier once you heat them together. Lay them together and heat the middle so that the solder melts and they are joined. Once you see the solder start to melt, you can direct it a little bit with the heat to the tip, but quickly remove the iron once it starts to flow. This allows the joint to cool and harden quickly. You can also then add a little bit more solder to the joint if you don't feel it's attached well enough at this point too. Then either use some heat shrink tubing or some electrical tape to cover up your solder joint and keep it protected. This is the most basic attachment for wires, but it is not the strongest. If you care to look it up, Google how NASA solders wires, and you'll see the strongest wire connections you can make with soldering. This is really overkill for video game repairs, but there are some easier options like what I did in my controller cable replacement video here. It goes without saying, but I'm going to anyway. Don't work on anything that's powered on or plugged in. It's not worth the risk of shock or damage to the components if it shorts out. And don't work on a power supply if it has not been properly discharged either. Some of the larger capacitors can still hold enough of a charge, even after being unplugged, to still kill you. They're no joke. Work on these items at your own risk or look up how to discharge them properly before opening them. Desoldering items. Desoldering is another basic yet essential task that you'll need to know. Do you need to remove and replace a broken component? Maybe you added a little bit too much solder to a joint and either it overflowed or it just doesn't look great. Having a way to remove solder from that area is sometimes critical. I like to use a desoldering braid, but there are also solder suckers and desoldering irons specifically for this task. A solder sucker is the more manual version of a desoldering iron where you heat up the joint you need removed, then use suction to suck up the solder while it is still molten. By the time it is sucked up in the tube, it'll harden into a small little ball too. The desoldering braid is a braided cable of copper that's infused with flux. When it is heated on top of a component, the solder flows easier due to the flux, and the braid soaks in the solder to remove it from the area. You just clip off the end of the braid and continue your work. It's the really easy option, but how do you use it? Preheat the joint you'd like to remove by touching it with your iron to make it flow a lot easier. You can also add some new solder to your tip and mix it with the old to get it moving better too. Then touch your braid to the joint first, followed by your iron, so when it heats up, the braid soaks in the solder. This may take a few tries to get it all, depending on what you're taking apart, but just repeat the process until you can easily remove the part from the other side of the board. Using tweezers to remove the parts may be required depending on how hot they're getting to. Do this on your test board until you feel like it's going smoothly and you could repeat it easily. 
Through-hole components are your next most abundant item you'll find on old electronics. Through-hole simply means the components, which are the resistors, capacitors, diodes, transistors, etc., are all installed on the circuit board through a tiny hole where the component legs can fit through. Once they are placed in these tiny pre-drilled holes, they are soldered down and the component legs are trimmed so that they are flush with the bottom of the circuit board. If you haven't already, remove some of these through-hole parts from your old circuit board, but don't throw them away just yet. Make sure the legs aren't too bent up, and if they are, just try to straighten them out as best as possible. Now insert at least one side of those same components back into the board and you don't even need to put them in the same spots. Remember this is your test board so it doesn't matter if it works again. Go to the opposite side of the board and bend the leg a different direction to get it to stay in place. Touch your iron to the pad and add solder to the top of the leg and pad until it's filled up. Quickly remove the iron when the solder has filled the pad and it should make a smooth bright cone shape when you're done. Then trim the excess so it is flush with the top of the cone shape. It shouldn't be so large that it's hanging off the board or touching any other parts either. If it is, just trim it down further or use your desoldering braid to remove the excess. This whole process should only take a few seconds, so if you're heating the joints for a lot longer, it could burn the board or damage the part. You shouldn't worry about this in the beginning while you're practicing, but it's something to keep in mind while you're working on a real example in the future. Repeat this process until you get it consistent, bright small cone shapes that are smooth. If available, it may even be easier to consistently repeat this soldering process with larger IC chips too. Surface mounted parts are the new norm for electronics today. These parts tend to be a lot smaller and more densely packed on circuit boards. They're typically installed at the factory by baking the entire circuit board while all the parts and solder are in place. Due to that, they are also much harder to work with too. I do not recommend working with surface mounted components until you have a good grasp of the other soldering methods. These are typically not easy to replace and require smaller tools to hold and install the parts properly. The good news is, since surface mounted parts are mainly used in newer consoles, you won't really need to deal with them much if you're fixing older legacy items. However, the one device that used them a lot and is notorious for needing repairs is the Sega Game Gear. The electrolytic capacitors on these older handhelds almost always fail and will need to be replaced at some point. I plan to do a full repair breakdown in the future on how to replace all the capacitors in one of these, but for now, grab your old practice board and see if you have any. These are the capacitors you're looking for. Unfortunately, they are difficult to remove and just as difficult to replace since the little plastic base they sit on is easily damaged. Desoldering isn't super difficult if you can see the solder joints on the sides of the part though. If you can't see them and you plan to replace the part anyway, just cut it off. Trust me, it is way easier and cleaner to do it this way. After you remove the little base parts, you can see how it's attached and then remove those other little legs easily with a pair of tweezers and your iron. Putting these parts back in place though is a little tricky, but I've found a good method that seems to work well most of the time for me. Start by filling the two pads with a little more solder than you normally would. Whether you add the solder to the tip or fill the pad directly, it's up to you. But leave a larger amount of solder there, but not too much where it's a huge bubble. Then grab your surface mounted cap with tweezers and make sure it's being placed in the right direction. It is typically labeled on the board which way they should go in case you've forgotten, and there's a little cutout on one side typically. Then while holding it at a slight angle, heat up one pad and hold the cap in place until the solder hardens. Then rotate the board so the other pad is facing your iron and using your tweezers, apply light pressure to the top of the cap while heating the second pad. Once it is in place, go back to the first pad and reheat it with the same process, adding a little pressure to even the cap out on the board. You don't want these to stick up too high on the board and you also don't want them tilted too much either. I found this method works the best for me, but maybe you'll find another one that works even better for you. If you do, post a comment down below on how you perfected it, because I would love to know your process. The two most important things to remember when soldering surface components is to not damage them during install and to not add too much solder. These can easily be solder bridged if you push too hard, too quickly, or use too much. The soldering process. The last part of basic knowledge is cleaning. Proper cleaning before, during, and after repairs is an essential task that you need to force yourself to make a habit of doing. And cleaning doesn't mean only the circuit board you're working on either. It also means the tip of the iron. If the tip isn't clean, it doesn't heat as well, nor does it accept solder as well either. You remove a part from your practice board, clean the tip. You add it back, clean the tip. You have extra solder on the tip after tinning some wire, clean the tip. You left your iron on and are working on other stuff and haven't soldered anything for a while. You get the idea. Same goes for the circuit board. Use high percentage isopropyl alcohol with some Q-tips for cleaning because it will dry the fastest. It eats through the rosin flux easily without damaging any parts on the board too. If you have pools of flux, always clean it before you're done because it is acidic and can damage the parts on the circuit board over time if left in place. I tend to clean as I go so it's not such a large job at the end. This might be a little overkill, but it's always worked well for me. So those are the basics of soldering, plus maybe a little bit more.
But if you have any other questions about the whole process, leave a comment down below. Thanks for watching, and I'll just put you back where I found you over there. Let me just let me just get you in. Watch your head. All right, well, see you next fix.